So Susan, I mean, from the very beginning, you were just raring to come to Detroit, right? No. Um, I think the information that, that I knew about Detroit and stuff that you'd been sharing with me, just, I think with it being the murder capital and the rape capital and me having three daughters and five children together was certainly, a, that was a struggle yeah. to put myself and my kids in that kind of a situation. Yeah, I remember. I mean, you kind of, I was putting Michigan magazines near the, uh, in the bathroom and putting little indicators, but Susan was like, you know, no, that, that, I don't think so. And so just put the brakes on. And uh, about six weeks later, I'm at the church office where I'm at in Hillsborough, Oregon, and I'm on the phone with Susan talking about urban church planning. And she said something like, well, it seems like we should really consider Detroit. After all, you're from the area. And I was like, what? Like, did an alien just take over my wife's body? Six weeks, and she's like that, but that's kind of how it worked. Asking God, A, are we crazy, or B, are you sending us to Detroit? And the answer is yes, you're definitely crazy, but yes, we're, we're sending you there. He gave us Central Detroit, which is where we're at, 4802 and 206. Susan, what was your first uh, impression on, on your first scouting trip after we I think it was the second trip you came with us. I think, you know, you can look at pictures on the internet and see the, the buildings and the houses, um, but when you actually see it in person, it, it's, it's like a smack in the face. I think for me, the churches and the, the school buildings, seeing these places of education and places of, you know, religious activity that are just de destroyed and, and, you know, that, that's heartbreaking. It's yeah. really heartbreaking. Yeah. So we moved here then two days before, when I came on one more scouting trip, moved two days before Thanksgiving 2010, and we lived with the Bontragers for six weeks. They kicked us out. They got tired of us. The Lord opened up a house, just a kind of kitty corner, next block over, and we're renting that. And Susan, what, like, how would you describe your first two or three months on the ground in Detroit? in this area, people are outside all the time. They sit on their front porches. It's not like being in a suburban uh, neighborhood where you go in the, in the carport or in the, in the garage and the door comes down and you don't ever see them. Everybody's on their front porch, everybody's in their yard. So we would walk a lot, pretty much daily, get to, you know, talking to people. We had cookouts every Friday night, either at our house or at the Bond Traker's house. And we invited um, everybody from four streets, uh, I don't even know, remember the, the, how many blocks it was, five blocks and four streets, and ended up having about 100, 100 people the first cookout, I think, and um, just continuing to do that, and just, um, wait, what else did we do? We've done a lot of stuff, I can't the remember The sports anything. outreach. Yeah, we did the sports outreach with the kids, and um, decided that we were going to take uh, a little park that's close to our house, and fix that up, and mow it, and kind of weed it, and take care of the basketball courts and the tennis courts. And, um. One of the things I remember about having all the kids go to the house, we had the sports reach. And, uh, and uh, one day I said, hey, why don't you guys watch you guys in my house? And they're like, OK, okay, okay yeah, we're going to yeah, drive out to the suburbs, because they made the assumption us being slightly white, uh, that we live uh, uh, on the other side of eight mile. mile. But when they found when they out that we were actually about five, five, five and a half blocks, blocks from, from the ball field, ball field court, court. It's like it's their, like their, 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 um, their defense system went that much, much farther down. down. And really, that, that, was, was, that, was, that was the that birth, was the birth of a lot of relationships. relationships. And some of those some guys, older guys, come to our house. Pretty much every day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. every day. Coming to our Bible study now, the older guys. And so God has just opened up opportunities by living right in the area. I think um, just the Lord kind of, he just overwhelmed us with uh, blessings of people who were already interested in Restore coming and, and wanting to find out more about it and then just our neighbors, you know, beginning to, to warm up and, and open, open themselves up to us was, that was, that was a real, real blessing yeah. for me. Imagine being a farmer, going to a field that has already been seeded. The only thing you need to bring is water and fertilizer as you wait for the sun to bring forth fruit. Well, this demographic is a lot like that. It's churchified, it's cultural Christianity, uh, which gives a caricaturized and distorted view of God, but at the same time, in the soil of so many people's hearts, 
truth about God and scripture have been embedded. And we're praying that as we preach the gospel in clarity, seeking to show and tell Jesus in all of life, that the spirit of God is going to give life to the seed of the word that's been planted in people's hearts by virtue of church culture and bring forth eternal life. And yesterday there was a guy in my uh, living room. He's a guy that I'm discipling. Uh, it's an African-American couple by way of Liberia in the last 15 years. Um, he said they want to step on board with Restore. And at the story last time, he said, I'm not really sure if Jesus was always God and didn't become God until the resurrection. And I was able to take the stories that he learned in his Liberian context and then in the churchified African-American context here and show him how the very scriptures that he's, he's, he's quoted to me show that Jesus Christ has always been God. And you can see the lights going off. And so it's one thing to do ministry in a liberal white area where there's so many obstacles that you have to cross to get to God. But in the African-American context, God talk is normal, normative, and frequent. It's just our position, our opportunity then, to get to the truth of who God is, marshalling what they've learned, and showing how it points to Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Satan wants no, but he loves it that people are inoculated with Bible things. He loves that, but it's not gospel. And so if we can use those things that Satan's actually happy that they know because they feel, hey, I got it. If we can use those things and leverage them so we can get to the gospel and they can see where they know these stories, but it doesn't mean anything to them. We can leverage that. And we can see salvation happen because then it clicks. They said, oh, I see why that story is connected with this and this. And doing a high overview of the Bible like we're doing right now through the story actually helps them when they do know a little bit of spiritual things. And so something I think Satan wanted to use, which was inoculated them through biblical teaching, actually we're seeing fruit from now. And so that's exciting to me. Yeah.